Okay, good afternoon everyone that's decided to join us on this lovely sunny day. Um, we've got uh, quite a few people on the line, so just a bit of housekeeping. You are all on mute while we go through the process here. If you've got any questions or want to make a comment, please do so, but use the chat function. And what we'll do is the team will pick it up, and if it's relevant, I'll try and answer it as we go along. If not, hopefully well, there'll, there'll be time at the end for questions. So we're going to talk today about traffic sign maintenance. So I'm going to focus primarily on the maintenance of signs. There's a little bit on uh, road markings as well in here, just from some surveys I've picked up. In case you're not familiar with this series of webinars, last year we asked the industry what subjects they'd like to cover. We gave a wide choice and four subjects came out on top. And we're actually going to do the second one today. This is on traffic sign maintenance. The next one in September, we'll show you a link at the end, is on lighting. And the fourth one in the series is on sign clutter. So what will we cover today? So we're going to cover what makes an effective traffic sign. We've done a few of these slides before if you attended our first in this series. That talks about what the science behind an effective traffic sign. And then actually a, a little survey that came out a few months ago, a bit of a study um, by the Office of Road and Rail about what drivers want from traffic signs in respect to maintenance actually. And then I'm going to do a quick quiz, a bit of a knowledge check just to see what you think and, and from based on the stuff we've done so far. Then we'll talk about measuring performance, so how I went about some of the examples, and some helpful hints for maintenance, and uh, at the end, a little bit of a summary. So what makes an effective traffic sign? So let's look at some examples of what probably doesn't make an effective traffic sign. This one, not very effective, slightly annoying, I would suggest. I'll do this one. Yep, sharp intake of breath is always a bit of a tut at the back of the room. Should, should we laugh at that? Should we find that funny or not? But there is a scientific reason why that is slightly awkward. This one, is this an effective traffic sign? Almost certainly not. And this is clearly the subject of our uh, presentation today. The reason it's not effective is because it causes this. These two signs, this sign is not related to that incident, but I'm just there for example, for instance. And this one. I still, this is still remains one of my firm favorite signs because they've turned what is a very difficult situation, trying to make it not look like it says dull Highland safaris into a dull Highland safari. So in a genius stroke of marketing, the town of Dull in Scotland twinned with a town in Oregon called Boring. I kid you not. And there's the sign. That's a very effective sign, if you ask me. It gets attention, certainly. The next one's probably more ironic than it is funny. I'll leave that one there. I'll make no comment about motor vehicles. This one, the sign looks okay, but looking behind, just behind the sign, it clearly wasn't effective, really, was it? And the last and my favorite or least favorite, if ever I see it, really seriously, sign not, what is the point of that sign? I really do not understand why that is placed there. But anyway, there's a reason that we find those funny. And actually, when you look at the science behind it, the CIE did a study, it's study number 74, and that looked at the effectiveness of a traffic sign. And they came to the conclusion, you need these four things reading from left to right on the screen, in this order to be able to read a sign. Conspicuity, legibility, comprehensibility, and credibility. So that means conspicuity to attract attention. If we can't see it in the first place, we can't do anything about it. We can't move on to this step, legibility, to be able to read it. And clearly from that little image on the screen, you can see also part of what we're discovering today. After legibility comes comprehensibility. That's the ability to to understand it because reading and understanding are not the same thing certainly not when you're dealing with that traffic sign and the last stage I think that what most of our signs in our beginning section fall under is credibility actually the driver needs to act upon the sign if he doesn't believe the information he's shown even if he reads it and understands it he still may not act upon the sign so credibility is important and I think some of those are pretty not credible especially the first one 
So if you break that down, like I've done here, we can, we can look at some of the macro things that affect that. And I've just highlighted in red these bits, lighting, design, and placement. Realistically, those things all affect conspicuity, legibility, comprehensibility, and credibility, but they're controlled pretty much by regulation and standards. So the TSRGD, in our case, really controls the shape and design of a sign and the placement, more or less, to a less degree these days since the changes last year, and um, the placement. The relevance of a sign still realistically is down to the designer. But what we're going to look at here is the first section, because without this section, we can't go on to, to comprehend and we can't go on to act upon the sign. And actually, the reflectivity and color and transmissivity and contrast are extremely important important and reflectivity really affects both conspicuity particularly at night so in other words the attract attention bit and the legibility of it and that realistically is down to the materials used so uh, this is why we'll get come a bit more onto materials a bit later but that's the science behind what makes it work but the drivers agree so we're going to look at a little study here this was brought to my attention not very long ago and i thought this is absolutely great this works really well for my presentation uh, and it, it comes from the office of road and it was put together by transport focus and it's measuring performance of england's st strategic roads what users want so what i really liked about this was they went out and they asked road users their opinion this is mainly about the strategic road network but it does also many of the principles clearly do apply to any road we will have a handout of this we will attach the pdf at the end for those that are interested so looking at the study, a brief overview, I won't review the whole thing. I will just pick out the key elements to, relevant to this subject. They had many, many focus groups, four users in each group, and then they had seven in-depth interviews across all seven Highways England regions. So they had different people in different areas answering questions. They then did the same thing again with 147 different road users. So hopefully that's a reasonable sample size to give you an idea of where they went. The little infographic here tells you really what users wanted, and that was journey times. They were interested mainly in journey times and safety, clearly. Now, the linkages here kind of show you that signage and information strongly links to journey times and safety. So does drive, driving speed to a degree, driving behavior, road work management, and incident management, but we're going to focus on the, the subject of traffic signs, so that's the link here. So some of the results are some of the bits I've picked out. There are many more, so I do urge you to read this document. Important factors for, for road users for signage. Proportion of signs that are clearly visible. Now, clearly that does have a link to maintenance. How useful is the information on signs and road markings? And the speed of updating information on electronic signs. That we will not at all cover today. It was pointed out and it, came, it became fairly obvious that there was a concern about um, the traffic signs on the left-hand side being blocked by H HGVs and mists. I think that really relates to major roads when there is a big queue on, on the inside lane and sometimes it can be difficult. So there was, there was some talk about how gantry signs are, are much better at dealing with that. But it was an interesting comment. I hadn't thought about myself before I decided putting this together. Little comment on road markings. Not the subject of our presentation, but nonetheless, we are talking about traffic signs in this presentation. Road markings should also be considered when we were dealing with maintenance. They are important. They do delineate and they do inform drivers, so they shouldn't be forgotten. Comment here from one of the users. It's really helpful when, when it's there on roundabouts. So when you have the delineation markings around roundabouts to tell you which lane to get into, although I must say the roundabout near my house, it appears that nobody knows how to read a white line. And clear instructions was, a, was an important factor here. I like the comment here. It's not necessarily more signage. It's better, clearer signage. And that's a message that the government have tried to, to get across. And I've got just a little image there of uh, one of my favorite road signs and one of my favorite road junctions, the Magic Roundabout in Swindon. It's actually a brilliantly designed scheme, but it's extremely nerve wracking when you first come up to this and look at all those roundabouts that go, that means I can go right to get to the right rather than go left it's quite confusing but nonetheless um, it's a good example of a fairly intimidating sign positioning of signs was, was considered to be important 
So one of the comments there should be more frequent signage, so it doesn't matter if you miss one. Interesting. I'm not sure I always agree with that, but sometimes it, they just need to be in the right place. So that's, I think it's important is, is positioning here. More countdown markers and more warning of which lanes you should be into. That's an interesting one as well. If you've seen some of the new smart motorway signage, a lot of that has improved. I really like some of those overhead signs de delineating which lane to get in before an exit. I think it's a massive improvement. I'd like, it'd be great to see more of that. This one was an interesting one again for me because uh, it, it was a bit thought-provoking. Proportion of signs that are clearly visible. So the comments here about think feedback's the main thing, allowing users to report when a sign isn't visible and should check signs regularly for maintenance issues. And I did think, uh, actually, is there a mechanism in my local area to report failed traffic signs or ones that are can't, ones that can't be seen? Maybe it's one that's been hit by a truck and no one knows about it. So if you're in, if you're in this area, do you know of or do you have a mechanism? We're going to ask you a quick question, a quick poll here. Do you have a mechanism for reporting failed traffic signs, bad traffic signs, however you want to work, you know, if it's maintenance, whatever it is, you can get the general feedback. If you've got poor signs, can users report that to you? So we're just going to ask you a quick poll. It's yes, no, or not applicable. It may be not applicable to some of you. We'll see how many of you click and we'll just see. So there we go. So we've had a few respondents. Okay, I'll just give that a few more seconds. Once we get over 70%, which we're already there, okay, 85% of you have voted. So yeah, 53% of you said you have a method to do that. So it would appear that the general public in this case, this, this person here, doesn't know that. So it's interesting. And I don't know that in my local area. I should probably look harder, bearing in mind my job. So I'll, I will, I'll double check that when I finish this. Thanks for that. Obstructed and worn out signs. An interesting one, clearly, um, where we will lead on to with, with maintenance. Signs should be clear, readable, and free of graffiti. Yes, that's um, a fairly obvious thing to say, and we'll talk about graffiti a little later. So, bearing in mind our little whistle-stop tour of the science, we're going to have a, a little quiz now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an image of a traffic sign. And I'm just going to ask you if you think it's acceptable. Now, when I say acceptable, I mean don't mean whether it's lawful, unlawful. I mean, is it acceptable to the driver? So would you accept this as a driver? So here's the first example. It's a very, very easy one. Have a look at the image for a second or so. Is that sign acceptable? Yes, no, or don't know are the choices. We'll pop that on the screen for you now. We might have to wait a little longer next time for the, to see the image, but I hope you got the point with that one. So there, that was very quick, and I'm very glad it was very quick. A bit of an easy one, like a game show. Let's do the easy one to get you started. It doesn't get much more difficult, like who wants to be a millionaire? But clearly, no, it's not acceptable. It's completely obscured by vegetation. That, and as you can see, that's very close to the sign. Even when you get right next to it, you cannot read it. So the next one. Is this sign acceptable? We'll leave this one on the screen a little longer. And if you're asking which sign, then uh, that probably answers the question itself. So let's put the poll up. Let's see what you think. Is it acceptable? So we've got a, it's not quite a split of opinion, a very strong opinion here. So 93% said no, 3% I don't know, said I don't know, and 3% said yes. Well, actually, it's not acceptable, and for many reasons. Um, it is a low bridge height sign, so it's a di diagram 531.1 for those of us reading from the old book. And Schedule 17 of those regulations said it must be lit within a street lit area, and that did not change in TSRGD 2016. It still should be lit within a street lit area. It clearly is not lit. It doesn't have any luminaire at all attached to it. And to compound that, one of the things, if you did tune into our last webinar, you'll know all about sign positioning. And that is a, a right-hand mounted sign from the driver's point of view, and it's quite high. So right-hand mounted signs get a lot less light, and truck drivers get a lot less light from signs in general. So it's a high bridge, it's a low bridge sign. It's aimed at truck drivers, so its audience receive far less light than it's than anybody else 
and it's not lit. So really not a great idea, that one. There isn't another lit version of that sign until you hit the bridge, by the way. And I, when I say hit the bridge, I mean that literally. This one, it's a bit difficult to see. It was a beautiful sunny day, so as you can tell, it was probably taken the last few weeks. So is this sign acceptable? Bit of a tricky one, this one. So let's open the polls. I thought this one might be a bit divisive. Good. Took me a while to even think what I might consider as the answer. So where are we up to with percentage? Yeah, we're almost there, so I'll do. So 30% said yes, 64% said no, and five said I don't know. It's actually quite a tricky one until you look at it at night. There's a couple of things. It's You could argue the sign is legal. The school crossing sign in daytime is badly faded, so its daytime visibility is very poor. When you get further from that sign, it's hard to see it's a school crossing. You can actually see the sign below it. As you can see, those the, up, the upper sign and the, the legend are very faded. They're also not reflective. They don't reflect or they are white. And But that was perfectly acceptable with the Luminaire, which does work. If that Luminaire fails, that sign is really not effective. The bottom sign is retro-reflective, but doesn't really get any light from the Luminaire. So I think it's a bit of a mixed message. I think it's, a, it's not a great sign. It's technically okay if you if you like so a bit of an interesting discussion on that one and the next one this is an image i didn't take myself i was sent this one so i i think we can there's a couple of points on this so if you have a look at that one for a second and then yeah start the poll let's see what you think acceptable or not i think it's fairly obvious this one How uh, were we doing for 80% voted, so I'll go with that. 4% said yes, 96% said no. Not quite a trick question. There's a couple of points, though. So, firstly, algae really is obscuring that sign. So, daytime visibility is extremely poor. Nighttime visibility, I didn't take a picture, as I say, I didn't do this one myself, would be almost non-existent from that. It really would be terrible. Point to the right there, there's a little temporary sign for housing development. So that should have been removed after six months. I don't know when it was placed, but I would ask the question, somebody went along to this very, very dirty sign and placed a brand new sign underneath it at some point and didn't report the fact that you couldn't read the sign above it. So there's some really bad practice going on there. I do, I do, if anybody from this authority, or anybody that placed that sign is on the audience, I do apologize, I'm not picking on you, but it's just, I'm just using it as an example that you know, somebody put that sign up there and just went, oh, it's fine. This one, tricky one. Last one, in fact. Have a good look at it. And we'll see what we say. So that's been on the screen, hopefully, for a few seconds. And we'll start the poll. Is this one acceptable? They're all very quick on the buzzers. It's like a game show. It's very good fun. OK, 16% say yes. 82% say no, and 2% say I don't know. Well, I'll show you a couple of things. Firstly, blue border signs should have been removed by 2014. So they were actually obsoleted in 1994 with the introduction of the Guildford rules. So that tells you this sign is at least 23 years old and there were 20 years to replace it. Now, I do understand certainly that with budget constraints, removing and replacing blue border signs is probably not going to happen in many areas. If they are still working for the driver, you would probably have the argument that they're still not bright enough, they still work. Nonetheless, the regulations say it should be removed. Difficult gray area, and I do feel for people trying to, to, to replace these or fighting the battle not to. This sign, however, as you can see, has a slightly damaged sign face. And because I now know from looking at it, it's more than 23 years old, it's quite old material. So I thought I'd check it, and we'll talk about, about that, that in the next section. So I measured it with my retro reflectometer to measure how efficient it is at returning light. And it failed. It does not return enough light to meet the standard. And we will go into that next. 
So to understand what I mean about reflectivity, we'll first talk about the, the basics of that and then about standards. So there are actually three kinds of reflection. First type, most people are familiar with, is the mirror reflection. I must change that color from yellow. It's a bit hard to see on my screen. So yeah, light hits the subject and comes back off at the opposite angle. After that, you have diffuse reflection, which is very much like a light shining on your wall. Light hits the wall and scatters off in different directions. What a traffic sign does is retro reflect. So the light from the headlight hits the traffic sign and comes back to the driver's eye. So when you see these things and they need to reflect, it's critical if it's not lit that it works because that's the only source of illumination that sign gets is the headlights bouncing from the sign back to the eye. A couple of things that are mentioned within the standards here and, and that we need to understand just from a measurement point of view is entrance angle. So this is fairly obvious on this drawing. That's effectively the sign twist in relation to the car. So that sign I showed you is actually quite twisted um, in relation to the car because it's on a roundabout and I'll show you the overhead of that later. That's the entrance angle. The other thing that's critical is the observation angle. And that really is how far out of the cone of light the driver would be that comes back. So you can see there's a, that it's the angle between the calculated from the car headlight to the driver's eye bouncing off the sign. That gives you a little triangle. And that the middle of that triangle is your angle. That's your observation angle. To, to, and just to compound that, because truck drivers are much further away from the headlights than car drivers, they actually get less light in the first place. So is that actually they'd be much closer to the sign by the time they get the same effective amount of light. So there's a few complicated things here to do with um, retroreflection. So when we measure it, we need to know the geometry. We need to know which entrance angle and which observation angle we're actually measuring. And what we use is a little handheld uh, device, as you can see. On the right, that's my hand holding that particular gun. And when I, I must say, when I did go out on my little survey and measure that particular sign I was showing the example for, I had a high visibility jacket on. I carried that gun towards a traffic sign. Everybody slowed down to 29.5 miles an hour. It was quite incredible. Who knows why? So what we're looking for here is the measurement from that gun. We place that machine on a traffic sign, a reflective surface. We press a trigger, and it comes back with a number. That's its RA value. It, that's effectively how efficient it is at returning light. So just to point out what we did with our machine, my machine is configured for 0.33 degrees observation angle and five degrees entrance angle. It's a standard equipment. It's a standard, it's a middle of the range, middle of the, middle of the um, charts for every traffic sign you can measure. So I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. And just for clarity, if you want to understand the, the dynamics of that, the average headlight to eye separation is about 600 millimeters. So you can, if you know that and you know the angle, which is 0.33, you can work out that that is 104.17 meters from the traffic sign. That's its effective distance. So the number we get will tell you how efficient the sign is at that distance, which is a usable distance. So it's actually the right measurement to use. You can buy devices that will measure every single angle within every single standard. I didn't do that on this occasion. So we'll actually now talk through what I did and how I did it and the thoughts behind auditing traffic signs. First thing, and the most important thing, is to have an objective. If you go back to our little picture with the um, algae over the traffic sign, if you are to measure the traffic sign to see if it's still within its warranted performance, then you might want to clean it first. But what you shouldn't do is just clean a small area, take a measurement and say it's working fine. And believe it or not, I have seen that. I will take a picture the next time I do. It's actually reasonably common. It depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to prove that the sign is bright enough for drivers and you go to measure it and it's dirty, log it and get it cleaned. It's, it's that simple much of the time and it really doesn't happen often enough. One of the more important things here also is which class of material. We've talked about retroreflection, but within the standards, there are different classes of material. And you need to know what you're comparing to. So if you've got a number that you've taken a reading from from this machine, you need to know what's pass or fail. And we will cover exactly that over this section. 
and the primary color. There's directions. There are lots of useful hints and tips in this um, in TD25, which we'll talk about. Um, it talks about measuring prim the primary color, which is typically white. But if you are measuring a motorway sign, which is primarily blue, it makes sense to measure the blue as well. I will explain why that can be a bit fraught with difficulties in a moment. And orientation is the last thing, just from a practical side. When you're going up, I've placed that um, machine on my traffic sign at zero degrees. All of the traffic signing regulation um, standards say that sheeting should work at zero or 90. So it's pointless measuring at 45 degrees rotation that we're talking about. So if you rotate the sheeting round by 90 degrees, it should work the same as it does roughly at 70, should at least exceed it. So what you shouldn't do is go and measure one sign where you're rotating a wrist at 15 degrees, another one where you're rotating a wrist at 45 degrees, because you're going to get inconsistent results, and that's not really right. We talked about classes. How do you figure that out? Actually, if it's a CE marked sign, it will clearly have the class of material marked on it. But as we know, the signing estate is relatively old. There will be signs out there that do not have the class of material written on them. Sometimes it's a bit of guesswork. There are images available that will tell you. I know. There are images. There are there are things that you can see that will um, that will show you which material it is. I'm just going to get my screen to come to life. Okay, back to that one. So looking here, I looked at this traffic sign. And I thought, OK, I know it's 23 years old. I could tell from its construction. Um, actually, it wasn't one of our products. But I know roughly where it will be. And so I know that prismatic material was introduced around there, around the 1989 mark. So it could be prismatic. But looking at the construction, I knew it wasn't. But I also know from the results, it's pretty certainly a class RA2 product. And I'll explain that in a little while. So looking at the classes in the standard, now we're going to kind of drill down into the measurements you see from a machine and how to interpolate that with the standard. So on the left hand there, highlighted in the red, is the observation angle. So this is class RA2. This is what I've assumed our sign is. I'm pretty certain it is. And it, you can see you've got 12, 20, and 2. Just to be confusing, and I do get questions about this quite regularly, that is not 12 inches or 12 feet or 20 inches or 20 feet. It's not 20 degrees or 12 degrees. It's actually 20 arc minutes in the middle and 12 arc minutes. Now, arc minutes are a, a slightly more finite, a slightly more granular measurement than a decimal of a degree. That's just why they used it within this standard. Um, I kind of disagree with that principle because it's so close, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a mute point. So if you look on the bottom right, I've got the conversion rate there. So to convert an arc minute to a degree, you times it by 0 0.01666667, and that gives you 0.33 of a degree. So I, I always thought that putting degrees and arc minutes on a, in a standard is a bit like going to the builder's merchant and asking for six meters of four by two. But there you go, I didn't set the standard. The next one highlighted in blue is our entrance angle. We talked about that earlier. And as we said, my machine measures 0.33 and 5. So therefore, for white, I should be looking for a result highlighted in yellow of 180. No darts jokes, please. Same if you look again. If I were doing that at 40 degrees, say my machine was 0.33 and 40, you do get adapters that will allow you to measure 40 then my result would then, I'd be looking for 95 or above. In general, there's no real reason to measure every single angle and every single entrance or observation angle. If you measure consistently and it doesn't meet that one angle, it's very unlikely it will meet any of the others. And you can see already why 0.5 and 3.33 are a good one to use. Because they're across the middle, it's the only common uh, across all three standards within the UK, all three classes within the UK. So class RA1 and class R3B do not share the same geometries. Only one is shared, and it's this one. So with this one set of geometries, you can measure any class of material. So there is a reason behind it. Just highlighting one of the things I mentioned earlier about motorway signs. 
and blue signs I should to be to be more specific if you were doing this one 0.33 and 5 and you were measuring blue you'd be only expecting a result of 14 so you can see the difference between blue and white is significant so and it's a very very small number so there's much less margin for error and that kind of shows um, on the next slide So taking our example here, here's what I did. I took three samples randomly around the sign face. You can probably tell roughly whereabouts they were from the fact that one, a couple are higher than the other. The average of those, is, of those samples is 142. As you saw from the previous slide, the reference value we're looking for, the minimum requirement when new, I'm gonna bring that one in now, is 180. What the standard does say and TD25, it needs to meet 80% of that value after weathering. So once it's been on the network for a while, it needs to meet 144 candelas per lux per meter squared. So that tells you that sign just about fails. It's very, very close, um, but it fails. It does not meet the requirements for RA2. It's almost certainly not, before anyone comments, it's almost certainly not an RA1 sign because even at 144, that's substantially more than most RA1 signs will ever produce. And I don't think I've ever seen one that can produce significantly high numbers. And also, it is a direction sign, um, although a minor route or leading to a minor, might leading to a major route, it should really be a class two material anyway if you're trying to inform drivers. That's another question we often get asked is, well, if the sign was put up when BS873 was in place, shouldn't we be measuring it to BS873? <laughs> you have to make that decision what you're trying to measure it against, but realistically, if the current guidance tells you what class of material traffic signage should conform to, you should really be measuring it to that, is my opinion. I'd love to hear anybody's counter argument on that because I'm always keen to understand how other people think on this particular subject. Another thing to consider when you, if you're auditing traffic signs and looking at them, clearly the measuring them is one part of it, as we've already pointed out. Cleaning them, checking whether they're actually visible in the first place is the most important thing. But you can do some really clever things with technology. So many of these devices will capture GPS data at the moment. So you'll get a nice little Google map if you're down there, or other mapping services are available, of course. And some devices will even tell you what color the object you were measuring was, which is great. If you're measuring different, if you've got patches on a sign or an ADS and you want to measure the green, the yellow, the white, the blue, whatever is on it, you can actually measure all the colors on the sign if they're big enough areas, and then it will automatically log the color you were measuring at the time. So it makes it really easy. Um, I haven't got one of those devices yet, but I'm certainly looking at one. The sign type's important. What are you actually trying to, what are you trying to do? What, what type of sign is it? Is it a direction sign? Is it a warning sign? There is an argument to say that warning signs are important as, and so are regulatory. Is a direction sign as important? It's a big question, really. If you're, if you're balancing budgets, a very difficult one to do. And of course, posts, clips, fixings, if you're going to go up to a sign and physically touch it with the device, it would make sense to check around the back, make sure the posts are okay, any electrical connections, and general safety. I've also taken a wide, there's on the bottom there, bottom right, you can see the wider shot of that sign. I've highlighted it in red so you can see it. So it is an awkward angle. So if you're approaching it from the, the road on the left, um, you're not going to see it. If you run, run it straight on, you will get it. If you're coming around the roundabout, that sign gives you absolutely no response at all. It's not very bright. So just put it into perspective of here's my little audit trail, if you like. So I created a little audit sheet, an Excel sheet. I've given each sign an asset number. I've recorded its install date where known. It's, it's latitude and longitude from GPS, type of sign, and it's class. I've also put in what its RA was, what its actual results, and the reference for the minimum, minimum. And the date of the last inspection. You could gather so much more information when you're doing this, um, but it's important that if you're going out to do sign maintenance, sign cleaning, or even hedge maintenance. If you've got people on the ground doing the work, they're, they're, they can do multiple things. And actually, you could you could save yourself some time by doing things, these things. And I'll leave it on the screen for one second, and I'll say, if anybody can tell me anywhere where these other locations are based on the latitude and longitude, um, bonus prize. 
there, there's, there's subtle hints in the date as well, but I will now move very quickly on. I just like to put an Easter egg in there for fun. Last takeaway from that reflects to my comments earlier, cleaning and consistency. If you're going to measure a traffic sign for, for performance, do it the same way. Don't do one sign in one way and another another because you won't be looking at the right data. And consistency with cleaning is, as we said earlier, don't clean small patches just to see if it's um, working. If it's covered in grime, grass, algae, whatever, it's not working for the driver. It's not about, it shouldn't be about you, it should be about the, the drivers reading the sign. So guidance, what is there out there? And a few hints and tips. Well, TD25 um, from the Design Manual for Roads and Bridges is a good document. It was updated in 2015. It was a little out of date before then, as we all know. It's still referenced BS873. But it is updated now to reflect changing standards. So it now references BS EN12899 Part 1. And it's got some very clear and good guidance on maintenance on primary routes, realistically. But the guidance, as we said at the beginning, actually applies to any traffic sign. If it's not working for the driver, according to the science at the beginning, it's not working. Therefore, some consideration for maintenance. So we will also send a link out to TD25 at the end of this within the um, end shot. So a couple of things I've picked out from TD25 with some images. They talk about obscuration of caused by dirt, graffiti, posters, vegetation, and other signs of structures. A very common failure, as we can see from my images. Lost, damaged, or fading of sign face material is another serious concern. Clearly from my image, there, there is this one. I saw a few more on my little drive around. Um, there is just one here for, for brevity. This was an interesting old image, this one, so I'm not sure this sign even still exists. I, I think perhaps not. But I, I thought the comment was, I hadn't thought of this myself, degradation in retroflectivity or variances where part of a sign has been replaced. As you can see on this sign, we've got one, two, three patches. Clearly they're there to cover something else as, the, as the, a, run, a junction has changed. But nonetheless, if you're using a brand new piece of material on a very faded sign, what that does to the driver is confuse them. They see this really bright thing and there's nothing there. So, it, Or you could have the opposite effect where if it, you have got text there, then it attracts their attention to one specific area of the sign and what you need them to do is read the whole sign. So that thing about attracting attention, attention and legibility, remember when you do this with reflective sheeting and you're patching, uh, you can affect our driver's perception of the sign. This one's fairly obvious, incorrect orientation of signs relative to users. I mean, this, this applies to twisted signs as much as it does to this slightly ironic leaning sign, road liable to subsidence. Really? Okay, tell us something we don't know. But clearly that does affect a few things. It doesn't affect how conspicuous the sign is. You can still probably see it if the reflective material is working, but it does make it a bit more difficult to read and possibly a bit more difficult to understand. And it definitely affects its credibility in this case. Incorrect vertical horizontal alignment of the panels of the sign. I actually took this picture from TD25 because I didn't have one in my local area. I could certainly find one, I'm sure, because this is typical of a truck strike on a, if they're going to hit um, the edge of a sign. We can see that this one doesn't look like that one, for instance, but it does make the sign very difficult to read. You can kind of guess it if you know where you're going, but if you're not familiar with the area, that's going to be very difficult to read. Failure of internal or external illumination under nighttime conditions. Yeah, if the sign needs to be lit by, by law, well in some cases the sign does not need to be lit according to the TSRGD, it just should be lit to serve drivers, then it should be lit. Otherwise they can't read it. This is an example I took um, very recently of the edge of a terminal sign. I couldn't take a picture further back because it wasn't safe to stop on the road. So I, was, I stopped fairly close and parked safely and took this picture of one side of a terminal sign not working. The other side is working, um, but nonetheless, it, um, it's a failed sign. The opposite also occurs, things like day burning lamps, they're not great, I mean, they're not, they don't do any harm to drivers, but it's hurting your electricity bill, and it's probably going to increase your maintenance because the bulb will be um, um, burning out quicker than it should do. So, leading to the close, 
a little bit on preventative maintenance. We talked a lot. I mean, see, it, it does feel like I'm sort of having a bit of a moan about overgrowth and dirty signs, <laughs> partly because I am because I'm a driver as well. But what can you do to avoid maintenance or to at least make maintenance less costly in the first place? There are a couple of things. I've got a few about five suggestions here. Things you can consider. So graffiti. So it is a problem in certain areas. I was interested to see a lot of that in um, TD25. I would think that was much more in the urban environment as well. Um, so consider a protective overlay film to combat graffiti. So obviously 3M have a product in this range. You can apply it over a traffic sign when it's manufactured and it makes removal of graffiti, stickers, um, lipstick, you name it, it comes off very, very easily. In fact, I've even seen it used for applying temporary signage on top. So low using anti-graffiti film and then an, a low surface energy film on top for temporary signage for car parking works quite well as well as in a unique solution. But I want to ask the question because I'm not sure how big a problem this is. So if you could quickly tell me, do you think graffiti is, an, is a big issue for you or not? Yes, no, or not applicable really, I think. Interesting. That it's, it's switching between the two. It's very, very close. I'm going to wait a little longer because we've got 81% of people have voted. Wow, it's really close. It's just, it's not stopped. Yeah, okay. I will read this now. At current point, it is 39% yes, 43% no, and 19 not applicable. So actually, yeah, it's a problem. So thank you for that. It's an interesting thing for me to look at. The other thing to consider is the flexibility of TSRGD 2016. Now, I'll explain this one. It's very, it's much easier to explain than it is to do a diagram or to show a picture. Now, when the regulations changed last year, it gave you, as a, if you're a designer, gave you flexibility on the placement of many signs, a particular one to do with repeaters and these terminal signs. It says a terminal sign you do not need to place two signs as a terminal sign. You can place just one, which kind of is counterintuitive. The idea was that in certain cases, um, one of those signs is not readable or usable by the driver. So if you're placing it because you have to, as before, then it's just clutter. It isn't serving the driver. But if you also consider another problem here, if you look at this image, the, the one on the left there, that's quite well kept vegetation. But imagine that wasn't. Imagine that location was where the sign was going to go. And there was a huge amount of bushes and trees there that are not regularly maintained. But just further along, there's a nice clear space. Those, those rules now allow you to move that sign so that it's not next exactly opposite the other one. Place it further down the road so it still informs the driver, but is no longer at risk of being overgrown by vegetation. So you can prevent and, and keep down your maintenance cycle by placing the signs in a different way because you now can by law. So there are many different ways you can consider that now, um, but it needs a bit of research into, into TSRG 2016 if you're not familiar. Same thing applies to lighting requirements. So lighting signs is a costly exercise. And with the removal of lighting requirements uh, relaxed, for even more signs within the TSRGB 2016, you have an opportunity to reduce your future maintenance by not lighting the sign. But there's always the caveat, consider drivers. Drivers need to be able to see that sign. So you need to consider which class of material, and in some cases, even if the law says you do not have to, sometimes it is advisable to do so to serve drivers. This idea came from the TSRGD, oh, sorry, from TD25. They talk about maintenance intervals and when to intervene and so on. There's lots of guidance. I will not go into that now. But one of the things that was pointed out was that any sheeting, any sign placed with CE marking should last the period of its warranty because they, are, they need to be passing weathering tests. So realistically, if you buy an engineer grade sign, then you shouldn't need to measure its re retroflectivity for the life of its warranty because it's warranted for that. So seven years for an engineer grade product. If you get up to the higher grades, class two and class three, um, with 3M warranty, it's 12 years. So realistically, you do not need to go and measure that sign 
for reflectivity for 12 years. So actually, if you've got a maintenance cycle over the lifetime of a sign, that can make a difference. However, big caveat there, that means you shouldn't have to measure it. That doesn't mean you should not have to clean it. I keep on doing it. I do feel a bit cruel now. No one was interesting when talking of cleaning and considering cleaning schedules. There was a study um, that looked at dirt pickup. And you, if you look at where the dirt is uh, from the roadway, actually signs mounted, mounted low and close to the verge pick up 50% of the dirt and spray from the road. That's a lot. So if you've got bollards, then bollards do need care and attention. They do need to be washed. And they do need to be high performance because you cannot see them when they're dirty. And if you look, you know, the further away and the further up you get from a sign from the road, the less dirt they pick up. The consequence of that is the further away from the road and the further higher up they go, the less light they get from the headlights as well. So it's a bit of a compound effect, a bit of a balancing act, that one. So we're actually running reasonably quickly, possibly even faster than I expected. So summing up, for a sign to be effective, it needs to serve as many users as possible. We saw at the beginning with our science slide that conspicuity and legibility are the two first steps in a user actually understanding a sign and then acting upon it. Without those first two steps, you cannot do the, the next two. And retroflective performance is critical for nighttime performance of traffic signs, particularly non-lit signs. If that material is not reflecting, for whatever reason, be it dirt, leaves, or poor performance, or old, just general old age, then the drivers cannot use the sign. And bear in mind my little picture of the school sign with the, the light above it. What you see in the daytime is not what you see at night. So if you're going to do an audit and a sign survey, you'll generally do that in the daytime. And if a sign looks OK to daylight, it may not work at night at all. Consider anti-graffiti products as a preventative maintenance step to try and do lower costs. And when placing signs, or when placing non-lit signs, consider high performance materials. Last takeaway from, from this, poorly maintained signs affect safety and journey times. And people care about that. There is much more to, to sign safe, much more to this than uh, we've actually discussed to say. There's a lot more in safety, electrical safety. We mentioned post clips and channels and poor installation. All of those things are all part of sign maintenance and sign inspection. Clearly, we don't have enough time today. And because of who we are and what I do, we focus mainly on retroflectivity. Um, there, as I say, there is lots of good guidance in TD25. Um, the link to that will be attached. Please do, um, if you have any questions about it, feel free to email me and I'll try and get back to you. So in summary, you wouldn't buy a car and expect it to perform for 25 years without maintenance. And hopefully, you'd wash it once in a while. That isn't my car, by the way. My car is often dirty, and I shouldn't say that. So thank you very much for your time and for, for your attention. If you have enjoyed today's um, webinar, we will be running another one on the 27th of September. That will be on the subject of sign illumination. So very much like we've done today, we will go through the science. We'll go into a bit more depth on the positioning of signs, because that's critical for lit signs. And then we will go through a, a run through of real scenarios of, of traffic signs and whether or not they should be lit in a similar fashion to we've done today. So please join me there. I'd like to like to see you. Um, we'll have a look now and see if we've got any questions. Have we got? Regarding the temporary sign on the dirty board, it's probably a developer sign erected by others. Yes, I would tend to agree. Yeah, good point. How much? Ah, how much does a reflectometer cost, and where can we get one? They they cost vary. Um, they start at around six or seven thousand pounds, and they go up to about twelve. Um, you could get them from various manufacturers. So there's a company called Delta Light and Optics. There's a company called uh, Road Vista. 
the, there are others out there on the market. I know of those two products because I've physically used them and I have two of them. Um, the trick with those devices is if you need the GPS capability and uh, anything else on there that's got Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all of the bells and whistles that they do, if you need it, it's probably worth buying it now because they charge you quite a lot for an add-on. Um, but if you don't need it, don't buy it. I, I know your needs first. Uh, question, there. what can I do to prolong the life of a sign? Uh, yeah, I think we kind of answered that mainly with the um, good maintenance, good cleaning, and possibly anti-graffiti if it's in that kind of at-risk area. Okay, excellent. Right, well, thank you very much uh, for joining in. You will receive an email at the end of this session um, asking for your feedback. Please do so, because it always helps us to build upon the next one. Uh, we've got one more question there. Where did that come on? Do you have a copy of the PowerPoint you can send out? We we can not do the PowerPoint, but unfortunately it's, it's so full of graphic and there's a lot of talking, it's very difficult, but we will send you a link to the video on YouTube.